Section 4 of Astounding Stories 4, April 1930. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Mark Nelson. Monsters of Moyenne by Arthur J. Burks. Chapter 9 Flowers of Martyrdom. For a minute, the secret agents were appalled by the air of might of the deep sea monsters of Moyenne, brought bodily almost into the secret room by the activities of General Munson at the sound and vision apparatus. Off the coast, miles away, yet looming moment by moment larger, indicating the deceptively swift speed of the monsters, were scores of the great underwater fortresses, traveling toward the coast of the United Americas in a far-flung formation, each submarine separated from its neighbor to right and left by something like a hundred miles, easy cruising radius for the little aero-subs carried inside the monsters. That each submarine did carry such spawn of Satan was plainly seen, for as the great submarines moved landward, Scores of aerosubs sported gleefully about the motherships. There was no counting the number of them. Two hours Manuel needed for his labors, which meant that for two hours the flower of the country's manhood must try to hold in check the mighty hordes of Moyen. Somewhere there, stated Prester Klieg, in one or the other of those monsters is Moyen himself. I know that, since he wished Charmian saved for his attentions. Do your work with your apparatus, Munson, while I go out to the radio tower to broadcast an appeal for volunteers. Charmian? Carlos? But Prester Klee found that he could not continue. Not that it was necessary, for Charmian and Carlos knew what was in his mind. Charmian was a lady of vast intelligence, from whom life's little ironies had not been hidden and Kane and Klieg had already discussed the activities of Moyenne where women were concerned. Prester Klieg hurried to the central radio tower, and as he passed through each of the many doors leading out to the roof of the new Capitol building, the guards at the doors left to form a guard for him, at this moment the most precious man in the country, because he knew best the terrible trials which faced her. The country was in turmoil. It seemed almost impossible that a whole day had passed since Prester Klieg had returned and entered the secret room. In the meantime, a fleet of battleships had been drawn by some mysterious agency out to sea from Hampton Roads, and a fleet of fighting planes which had followed the ghost column outward had not returned. News gatherers had spread the stories, distorted and garbled, across the western continents and throughout the Western Confederacy men, women, and children lived in the throes of the greatest fear that had ever gripped them. Fear held them most because they could not give the cause of their fear a name, save one. Moyen. And the name was on the lips of everyone, and frenzied women stilled their squalling babes with its mention. No word yet from the secret room, but Prester Klieg had scarcely appeared from it than someone started the radio signal which informed the frenzied, waiting world of the West that information, exact if startling, would now be forthcoming. In millions of homes, in thousands of high-flying planes, listeners tuned in at the clear-all hum. Prester Klieg wasted no time in preliminaries. Prester Klieg speaking. We are threatened by Moyenne with scores of monster submarines, each a mothership for scores of aero-subs, combinations of airplanes and miniature submarines. They're moving up on our eastern coast, from some secret base which we have not yet located. They are equipped with death-dealing instruments of which we have but the most fragmentary knowledge, and for two hours I must call upon all flyers to combat the menace, until the secret agents especially Professor Manuel, have had opportunity to counteract the minions of Moyenne. Flyers of the United Americas, in the name of our country, I ask that volunteers gather on the eastern coast, 
each flyer proceeding at once to the nearest coast landing after dropping all passengers. Your commanders have already been named by your various organizations, as required by franchise, and orders for the movement of the entire winged armada will come from this station. However, the orders will simply be this. Hold Moyen's forces at bay for a period of two hours, and know that many of you go to certain death and make your own decisions as to whether you shall volunteer." This ended, Prester Kleeg, excitement mounting high, hurried back to the secret room. Now the public knew, and as the American public is given to doing, it steadied down when it knew the worst. Fear of the unknown had changed the public into a myriad-souled beast gone berserk. Now that knowledge was exact, men grew calm of face, determined, and women assumed the supporting role which down the ages has been that of brave women, mothers of men. A period of silence for a time after Prester Kleeg's pronouncement. As he entered the first door leading into the secret room, Carlos Kane met and passed him with a smile. You called for winged volunteers, did you not, Kleeg? he asked quietly. Kleeg nodded. You are going? he said. Yes, it is my duty. No other words were necessary as the men shook hands, Prester Kleeg going on to the secret room, Carlos Kane going out to join the mighty armada which must fight against the minions of Moyenne. The words of Prester Kleeg were heard by the pilots of the sky lanes. The passenger pits, equipped with self-opening parachutes, which dropped jumpers in series of long falls in order to acquire swift but accurate and safe landing, they opened at intervals in long falls of two thousand feet, stayed the fall, then closed again, so that drops were almost continuous until the last four hundred feet. And pilots, swiftly making up their minds, dropped their passengers, banked their planes, and raced into the east. All over the Americas, pilots dropped their passengers, and their loads if their franchises called for the carrying of freight, and banked about to take part in the first skirmish with the Moyanites. Dropping figures almost darken the sky as passengers plunge downward after the startling signal from Washington. Flowers, which were the umbrellas of shoots, opened and closed like breathing winged orchids, letting their burdens safely to earth. And clouds and fleets of airplanes came in from all directions to land, in rows and rows which were endless, wing and wing along the eastern coast. Prester Kleeg had scarcely entered the secret room than the hated voice of Moyen again broke upon the ears of the machine-like secret agents. "'This is madness, gentlemen. My people will annihilate yours.' But since time for speech had passed, not one of the secret agents made answer or paid the slightest heed to the warning though deep in the heart of each and every one was the belief that Moyenne spoke no more than the truth. Two, there was a growing respect for the half-god of Asia, in that he was good enough to warn them of the holocaust which faced their country. By hundreds and thousands, wing and wing, airplanes dropped to the Atlantic coast at the closest point of contact, when the signal reached them. At high altitudes, planes crossing the Atlantic turned back and returned at top speed, dropping their passengers as soon as over land. That Moyen made no move to prevent the return of flyers out over the ocean and now coming back was an ominous circumstance. It seemed to show that he held the American flyers, all of them, in utter contempt. Prester Kleeg regarded the time. It had been half an hour since Moyen had spoken of attack, half an hour since the monsters of the deep had started the inexorable move toward land. On the screen the submarines were bulking larger and larger as the moments fled, until it seemed to the secret agents that the great composite shadow of them already was sweeping inland from the coast. As the coast came close ahead of the monster subs, the little aero subs, to the surprise of the secret agents, all vanished into their respective motherships. But they have to use them, groaned Munson, for their submarines are useless in frontal attack against our shores. I'm not so sure of that, 
said Prester Kleeg, for I have a suspicion that those submarines have tractors under their keels, and that they can come out on land. If this is so, the monsters can, guarded by armor-plate, penetrate to the very heart of our most populated areas before their aero-subs are released." None of the secret agents as yet had stopped to ponder how the monsters had reached their positions, and why Moyen was attacking from the east, when the Pacific side of the continents would have appeared to be the obvious point of attack, and would have obviated the necessity of long, secret undersea journeys, wherein discovery prematurely must have been one of the many worries of the submarine commanders. The mere fact of the presence of the monsters was enough. What had preceded their presence was unimportant, save that their presence, and their near approach to the shore undetected, further proved the executive and planning genius of Moyen. Two miles on an average, off the eastern coast, the submarines laid their eggs the aero-subs, which darted from the sides of the mother-ships in flights and squadrons, made the surface and leapt into the sky. Five minutes later and the signal went forth to the phalanx of the volunteers. "'Take off! Fly east and engage the enemy, and hold him in check, and the god of our fathers go with you!' One hour had passed since Moyen's ultimatum when the first vanguard of the American flyers, obeying the peremptory signal, took the air and darted eastward to meet the winged death harbingers of Moyen. CHAPTER Ten, THEY SHALL NOT PASS Prester Kleeg's heartfelt desire, as the American flyers closed with the first of the aero-subs, was to go out with them and aid them in the attack against the Moyenites. But he knew it was a tacit thing that he best serve his country from the safe haven of the secret room. As he watched the scenes unfold on the screen of Manuel's genius, with occasional glances at the somewhat mysterious but profound and concentrated labors of Manuel, Charmian Kane rose from her place and came to his side. Wide-eyed as she watched the joining of battle, she stood there, her tiny hand encased in the tense one of Prester Kleeg. "'You would like to be out there,' she murmured. I know it, but your country needs you here, and I have already given Carlos. Prester Kleeg tightened his grip on her hand. There was deep, silent understanding between these two, and Prester Kleeg, in fighting against the Moyenites, realized, even above his realization that his labors were primarily for the benefit of his country, that he really matched wits with Moyen for the sake of Charmian. Had anyone asked him whether he would have sacrificed her for the benefit of his country, it would have been a difficult question to answer. He was glad that the question was never asked. "'Yes, beloved,' he whispered, "'I would like to be out there, but the greatest need for me is here.' But even so he felt as though he was betraying those intrepid flyers he was sending to sure death. Yet they had volunteered, and it was the only way." Manuel, a gnome-like little man with a titan's brain, labored with his calculations, made swiftly concrete his theories, while at the sound and vision apparatus excitable General Munson ranged the aerial battlefield to see how the tide of battle ebbed and flowed. That neither side would either ask or give quarter was instantly apparent, for they rushed head-on to meet each other, those vast opposing winged armadas, at top speed and not a single individual swerved from his course, though at least the Americans knew that death rode the skyways ahead. Then the battle was joined. Moyen's forces were superior in armament. Their sky steeds were faster, more readily maneuverable, though the flying forces of the Americas in the last five years had made vast strides in aviation. But what the Americans lacked in power they made up for in fearless courage. The plan of battle seemed automatically to work itself out. The first vanguard of American planes came into contact with the forces of Moyen, and from the noses of countless aero-subs spurted that golden streak which the secret agents knew and dreaded. The first flight of planes, stretching from horizon to horizon, vanished from the sky with that dreadful surety which had marked the passing of the stellar 
and such of those warships as had felt the full force of the visible ray. From General Munson rose a groan of anguish. These convertible fighting planes had been the pride of the heart of the old warrior. To do him credit, however, it was the wanton, so terribly inevitable destruction of the flyers themselves which affected him. It was so final, so absolute, and so utterly impossible to combat. Wait! snapped Prester Klieg. For the intrepid flyers behind that vanguard which had vanished had witnessed the wholesale disintegration of the leading element of the vast armada, and the pilots realized on the instant that no headlong rush into the very noses of the aerosubs would avail anything. The vast American formation broke into a mad maelstrom of whirling, darting, diving planes. Every third plane plummeted downward, every second one climbed, and the remaining ships, even in the face of what had happened to the vanished first flight, held steadily to the front. In this mad, seemingly meaningless formation, they closed on the aerosubs. Without having seen the fight, the Americans were aping the action of that one nameless flyer who had charged the aerosub that had been destroyed. Klieg remembered. A score of ships had been destroyed utterly above the graveyard of dreadnoughts, yet only one aerosub, and that quite by chance, had been marked off in the casualty column. Death rode the heavens as the American flyers went into action. For head-on fights, Flyers went in at top speed, their planes whirling on the axes of fuselages, all guns going. Planes were armored against their own bullets, and they were not under the necessity of watching to see that they did not slay their own friends. Even so, bullets were rather ineffective against the aerosubs, whose apparently flimsy, almost transparent outer covering diverted the bullets with amazing ease. A whirling maelstrom of ships the monsters of Moyen had drawn first blood, if the expression may be used in an action where no blood at all was drawn, but machines and men simply erased from existence. Hundreds of planes already gone when the second flight of ships closed with the aerosubs. Yellow streaks of death flashed from aerosub nostrils, but even as aerosub operators set their rays into motion, the American flyers in head-on charge rolled, dived, or zoomed, and kept their guns going. High above the first flight of aerosubs, behind which another flight was winging swiftly into action, American flyers tilted the noses of their planes over and dived under full power, to sure death by suicide, though none knew it there at the moment. These aerosubs could not be driven from the sky by usual means, and could destroy American ships even before those planes could come to hand grips, but they, the flyers plainly believed, could be crashed out of the sky, and so, never guessing what besides death in resulting crashes they faced, the flyers above the aerosubs, even as aerosubs in rear flashed in to prevent, dived down straight at the backs of the aerosubs. In a hundred places the dives of the Americans worked successfully, and American planes crashed full and true, full power on, into the backs of the flying fish. In some aerosubs the container of the Moyen dealing agency apparently remained untouched, and airplanes and aerosubs, welded together, plunged down the invisible sky lanes into the sea. Underwater, some of the aerosubs were seen to keep in motion, limping toward the nearest mother submarines. "'I hope,' said Prester Klieg, "'the American flyers in such cases are already dead, for Moyen will be a maniac in his tortures. Munson, do you hurriedly examine the mother subs and see if you can locate Moyen?' However, only a scattered aerosub here and there went down without the strange substance of the yellow ray being released. In most cases, upon the contact of plane with aerosub, the aerosubs and planes were instantly blotted from view by the yellow golden flames from the heart of the winged harbingers of Moyen. Golden flames, blinding in their brightness, dropping down, mere shapeless blotches, then fading out to nothingness in a matter of seconds, with aerosub and airplane totally erased from action and from existence. The American flyers saw and knew now the manner of death they faced. Yet, all along the battlefront, not an American tried to evade the issue and draw out of the fight. 
a sublime, inspiring exhibition of mass courage which had not been witnessed down the years since that general engagement which men of the time had called the Great War. Prester Cleek turned to look at Manuel. Drops of perspiration bathed the cheeks of the master scientist, but his eyes were glowing like coals of fire. His face was set in a white mask of concentration, and Prester Cleeg knew that Manuel would find the answer to the thing he sought if such an answer could be found. Would the American flyers be able to hold off the minions of Moyen until Manuel was ready? The fight out there above the waters was a terrible thing, and the Americans fought and died like men inspired, yet inexorably the winged armada of Moyen, preceded by those licking golden tongues, was moving landward. "'Great God!' cried Munson. Look! There was really no need for the order, for every secret agent saw as soon as did Munson. Under the sea, just off the coast, the mother subs had touched their blunt nose against the upward shelving of the sea bottom, had touched bottom, and were slowly but surely following the underwater curve of the land, up toward the surface, like unbelievable antediluvian monsters out of some nightmare. Yes, said Cleeg quietly. Those monsters of Moyenne can move on land, and the aerosubs can operate from them as easily on land as underwater. Cleeg regarded the time, whirled to look at Professor Manuel. One hour and forty minutes had passed since Manuel had begged for two hours in which to prepare some mode of effectively combating the might of Moyenne. Twenty minutes to go. Yet the mother subs would be ashore dragging their sweating, monstrous sides out of the deep within ten minutes. Ten minutes ashore, and there was no guessing the havoc they could cause to the United Americas. "'Hurry, Manuel, hurry, hurry,' said Prester Cleeg. But he spoke the words to himself, though even had he spoken them aloud, Manuel would not have heard. For Manuel, for two hours, had closed his mind to everything that transpired outside his own thoughts, devoted to foiling the power of Moyenne. "'I found him!' snapped Munson. He pointed with a shaking forefinger to one of the mother subs crawling up the slant of the ocean bed, twisted one of the little nubs of the sound and vision apparatus, and the angelic face and satanic eyes, the twisted body of Moyenne came into view. The face was calm with a dreadful purpose, and Moyenne stood in the heart of one of his monsters, his eyes turned toward the land. With a gasp of terror, dreadfully afraid for the first time, Prester Cleeg turned and looked into the eyes of Charmian. No, she said, it will never happen. I have faith in you. There were still ten minutes of the two hours left when the mother subs broke water and started crawling inland, swiftly, surely, without faltering in the slightest as they changed their element from water to land. As though their appearance had been the signal, the aerosubs in action against the first line of American planes broke out of the one-sided fight and dived for their motherships, while a mere handful of the American planes started back for home to prepare anew to continue the struggle. Prester Klee gave the signal to the second monster armada which had remained in reserve. "'Do everything in your power to halt the march of Moyen's amphibians!' Ten minutes to go, and Professor Manuel still labored like a titan. Chapter 11 Caucasia Falls Silent As the scores of amphibian monsters came lumbering forth upon dry land, it became instantly apparent why the aerosubs had returned to the motherships. For a few moments, out of the water, the amphibians were almost helpless, with practically no way of attack or defense as helpless as huge turtles turned legs up. But as each aerosub entered its proper slot in the side of the mother amphibian, it was turned about and the nose thrust back into the opening, which closed down to fit tightly about the nose of the aerosub, so that those flame-breathing monsters protruded from the sides of the amphibians in many places, transforming the amphibians into monsters with hundreds of golden, licking tongues. As, with each and every aerosub in place, the amphibian started moving inland, Professor Manuel made his first move. With the tiny apparatus upon which he had been working, 
he stepped to the table before the sound and vision apparatus and spoke softly to his compatriots. Gentlemen, he said, I have finished, and it will work effectively. Though Manuel spoke softly, it was plain to see that he was proud of his accomplishment, which remained only to be attached to start performance. A matter of seconds. Yet during those seconds was the real might, the real power for utter devastation of Moyen fully exposed. The amphibians got under way as the airplanes of the Americas swept into the fight. From the sides of the monsters licked out those golden tongues of flame, and from the front. Half a dozen amphibians slipped into New York from the harbor side and started into the heart of the city, and between the time when Manuel had said he was ready and the moment when he made his first active move against Moyenne, a half dozen skyscrapers vanished into nothingness. The spots where they had stood swept as clear of debris as though the land had never been reclaimed from nature. None was ever destined to know how many lives were lost in that first attack of the monsters of the golden, myriad tongues. But the monsters struck in the midst of a working day when the skyscrapers were filled with office workers. And resolve struck deep into the hearts of the secret agents. If Moyen were turned back, he must be made to pay for the slaughter. A matter of seconds. Then a moment of deathly silence as Munson gave way at the screen for the gnome-like little Professor Manuel. "'Now, gentlemen,' snapped Manuel, "'if my theory is correct,' manipulating instruments with lightning speed as he talked, "'the reversion of the principle of my vibration retarder, which captures vibration speeding outward from the earth and transforms them once again into sound and pictures audible and visible to the human ear, this apparatus will disintegrate the monsters as our boats and planes were disintegrated. In this I have even been compelled to manipulate in the matter of time. I must not only defeat and annihilate the minions of Moyenne, but must work from a mathematical absurdity, so that at the moment of impact that moment itself must become part of the past, sufficiently remote to remove the monsters at such distance from the earth that not even the mighty genius of Moyenne can return them. The whirring, gentle as the whirring of doves' wings. In the center of the picture on the screen were those half-dozen amphibians laying waste Manhattan. Manuel set his intricate, delicate machinery into motion. Instantly the amphibians were seen to become misty, shadowy, and to lift out of Manhattan up above the rooftops of skyscrapers still remaining nebulous and wraith-like as ghost shrouds, yet swinging outward from the earth with speed almost too swift for the eye to detect. But where the amphibians had rested there stood reclined, in all sorts of postures, surprising and even a bit ridiculous, the men of Moyenne who had operated the monsters of Moyenne. From the central radio tower went forth a mighty voice of command to the planes which had been engaging the aerosubs off the coast. Slay! Slay! Down flashed the planes of the Americas, and their guns were blazing, inaudibly, but none the less deadly of aim and of purpose, straight into the midst of the men of Moyenne, who had thus been left marooned and almost helpless with the vanishing of their amphibians and, noting how they fell in strangled, huddled heaps before the vengeful fire of the American planes, the secret agent sighed, and Manuel, his face alight with the pride of accomplishment, switched to another point along the coast. And as a new group of the monsters of Moyenne came into view, and Manuel bent to his labors afresh, the hated voice of the master mobster broke once more in the secret room. "'Enough, Krieg, enough!' we will surrender to save lives. I stipulate only that my own life be spared." To which Prester Klieg made instant reply. Did you offer us choice of surrender? Did you spare the lives of our people, which, with your control of your golden rays, you could easily have done? No. Nor will we spare lives, least of all the life of Moyenne. The whirring again, as of the whirring of doves' wings. More metal monsters, even as golden tongues spewed forth from their many sides, vanished from view, leaping skyward, 
while the operators of them were left to the mercies of the remaining airmen of the Americans. Voicelessly the word went forth, Slay! Slay! It was Charmian who begged for mercy for the vanquished, as, one by one, as surely as fate, the monsters with their contained aerosubs were blotted out, leaving pilots and operators behind them. Down upon these dropped the airmen of the West, slaying without mercy. "'Please, lover,' Charmian whispered, "'spare them!' "'Even,' he began, thinking of Moyenne, who would have taken Charmian. He felt her shudder as she read his mind, understood what he would have asked. "'There he is!' came softly from Munson. An amphibian had just been disintegrated, had just climbed mistily, swiftly, into invisibility in the skies. And there, in the midst of the conquerors left behind, his angel's face set in a moody mask, his pale eyes awful with fear, his misshapen body sagging, terrible in its realization of failure, was Moyen. Even as Cleek prepared to give the mercy signal, a plane dived down on the group about Moyen, and the secret agents could see the hand of the pilot lifted high as though he signaled. The plane was a mather. The pilot was Carlos Kane. Just as Kane went into action and the noiseless bullets from his ship crashed into that twisted body, causing it to jump and twitch with the might of them, Prester Klee gave the signal. Even as the figure of Moyen crashed to the soil and the man's soul quitted its mortal casement, Klee commanded, "'Spare all who surrender! Make them prisoners! To be used to repair the damage they have done to our country! Guards will be instantly placed over the amphibians and the aerosubs, for the day may come when we shall need to know their secrets!' And as men, hands lifted high in token of surrender, quitted the now motionless amphibians, and flyers dropped down to make them prisoners, Manuel sighed, pressed various buttons on his apparatus, and the mad scene of carnage they had witnessed for hours faded slowly out, and darkness and silence filled the secret room. But darkness is the joy of lovers, and in the midst of silence that was almost appalling by contrast, Kleeg and Charmian were received into each other's arms. The End of Monsters of Moyenne